love overcomes the awesome great thing. The awesome great thing. Oh, you are well better you conquer the grave. You free every captive and break every chain. Oh, God, you have done. Lord Jesus, we thank you that we can come together this morning as your children to celebrate you as our champion, God, the unshakable one that is above it all. Psalm 126 verse 3 says that the Lord has done great things for us and we are glad. And this morning, we are glad, Lord. It's with joyful hearts that we approach you and we come to worship you this morning because you are good and there is none like you, God. We worship your holy name. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh my soul, worship His only name. Sing like never before, and O oh my soul, I worship Your.
day when my strength is failing The end draws near and my time has come Still my soul will sing your praise Stretch out your right hand, and the earth swallows your enemies. In your unfailing love, you will lead the people you have redeemed. Welcome uh, to Seapoint Common Ground. Uh, we're in a side chapel here on the corner of Marie and Main Road. My name's Paul, and I'm grateful to be continuing the Exodus journey with you. This book uh, captures the story of God's people being drawn out of Egypt and then being drawn into the promised land. And today we get to see the second half of the book. You see, we've just got through the Red Sea. We've been taken out of slavery. We've been drawn out of the clutches of the tyrant Pharaoh. And now uh, a new path begins. Remember last week what was said in Exodus 14 as the people found themselves stuck between the Red Sea and the tyrant Pharaoh coming to get them. This is what Moses was able to say to the people. He said, fear not, stand firm, and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will work for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall never see again. The Lord will fight for you, and you only have to be silent. What a, counter, uh, what a countercultural uh, message. D- don't have to form a battle formation. Don't have to do anything. You receive the gift of being drawn out. The battle for the people was won by Yahweh as Pharaoh's armies are, are vanquished and they now find themselves on the other side of the Red Sea. What do they do now? What does this new freedom look like? What does it mean to be a people drawn out? Well, we're going to see the start of a 40-year journey now as they're drawn into becoming a new kind of people. And how are we going to look at this uh, passage of Scripture? Is uh, three, three ways. We're going to read through it, looking at the highs of worship, the lows of testing, and then finally the gift of resting. So let's look together at the highs of worship. Their toes are on the, the other side of the Red Sea, and the first thing they choose to do is sing. And let's read from the beginning of chapter 15. Moses and the people of Israel sang this song to the Lord. Should I, should I sing it for you now? Should I? No, no, I'm not. I'm just going to read it. I'm just going to read it. Don't worry. Here are the lyrics for the first recorded time that a group of people sing to Yahweh. The lyrics go as follows. I will sing to the Lord for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider he has thrown into the sea. The Lord is my strength and my song and he has become my salvation. 
This is my God, and I will praise him. My Father's God, and I will exalt him. The Lord is a man of war. The Lord is his name. These uh, lyrics continue. I, I don't have time to read through all of them, but I encourage you to grab chapter 15 and see the, the, the song of worship that comes from the people of God. And what's quite interesting is, remember, they were, they were trapped between the Red Sea and Pharaoh, and they were fearing Pharaoh. And then we saw that fear transferred. <laughs> and they no longer feared Pharaoh. They feared Yahweh. They feared God. And at that point, you might think, well, if they fear God, surely they should have downcast eyes. They should be uh, quiet as a mouse. But no, that's not what the fear of the Lord brings forth in us. No, the fear of the Lord is awestruck wonder and reverence for his authority and his power. And it leads to us overflowing in song. Think about um, locally, Mojo Market here on Seapoint Maid Road when South Africa won the World Cup. Think about hearing that your, your friend is uh, pregnant or getting married. Or think about, think about um, your relative being cured or, or, or healed from, from COVID uh, after struggling with that disease. I mean, these moments cannot be kept to ourselves. Those are moments that get celebrated. Remember, these are days before um, uh, music shops existed. There would have been rudimentary elements that came together. And we're going to see they, they didn't just sing. They, they, they played these instruments together. Uh, I'd love us to just pick up a few things and learn from them around what it means to experience the highs of worship together. So four, four quick things I note. First, notice that they remember specific events. Did you read there? There was a horse, there was a rider. There was content to what they were saying, and that goes throughout the whole song. You see, the good news is news. The good news is news. Maybe you've heard this phrase before, preach the gospel and if necessary, use words. Now, I appreciate the heart behind that. That's basically saying we need to practice what we preach, what we, what we say and what we do mustn't be two separate things. But the danger with it is it isn't the complete truth. You see, when we sing, there are specific things we say because those specific things tell of a God who rescued us, Jesus Christ. We're going to talk a lot about a cross, about resurrection, about the spirit being imparted, about the church being built up. Why? Because these are the specific things that give a framework. These are the very things that are truth of the most important, of the, of the greatest importance. So when we worship, we get specific because it's a person that we look to to rescue us and save us and redeem us. And we need to be thinking about him. And that's, and that's the second thing I pick up. Do you notice that the lyrics focus on God? Verse 11 says the following, Who is like you, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like you, majestic in holiness, awesome in glorious deeds, doing wonders? One of the things we say in Seapoint is that there are many things that can distract us, many things that vie for our attention, but our job as leaders in this community is to help you focus on what's eternally important. In a world that is endlessly distracting, we want to help you focus on what's eternally important, which is being with Jesus, becoming like Jesus, and doing what Jesus would do. And our worship should, should model this as well as we focus on God. So they have specific things that they look at. They focus on God. Thirdly, they look forward to the promises of God. Notice from verse 17, the lyrics continue, you will bring them in and plant them on your mountain, the place, O Lord, which you have made for your abode, the sanctuary, O Lord, which is your hands have established. This is the people that have celebrated what God's done in the past, but they also have, have a hope around the future as heaven and earth is kind of come together and be united as God is going to be present with his people. And they anticipate that day and that lifts their sights and that allows them to go through very challenging circumstances of deserts and wandering and, and disease. Likewise today, when we worship, we do so with a, with a, with a flavor of, of God's destination and God's presence fully with us. Final thing I just want to note is that they they. Go for it. There is joy in their worship. They've remembered the specifics. They've focused on God. They've looked to the future. But man, they just have great joy. Let's read from verse 20. It says, Miriam the prophetess, the sister of Aaron, took a tambourine in her hand, and all the women went out after her with tambourines and dances, dancing. And Miriam sang to them, Sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider he has thrown into the sea. And those lyrics, of course, the same lyrics we just read earlier about Moses as, as the number one hit single now gets repeated amongst the people of Israel. And again, remember, there weren't music shops at the time. I don't know what that tambourine was fashioned out of, or there was coconuts and, and a piece of rock. I don't know how they did it, but their commitment was to worshiping God with all that they had. 
Common Ground Churches, we look at at this first song of, of, of recorded of people on the other side of freedom. I, I hope something inside of you longs for, for that expression of what it means to be the people of God, to increase amongst us, right? Perhaps it was the area in COVID that we, we missed the most because we weren't able to give it full expression. And now as we're coming back, it just is, is such an opportunity for us to encounter God and to respond in worship, that's mentioned specific things that he has done, focuses on him, looks to our future with hope and, and does it all with great gusto. So those were real highs. Those were real moments of joy for the people of God. But pretty quickly as we read the story now, they come short. They fail. The same people that were worshiping God are, are now going to go through a period of testing and the, the test results are back and it didn't go well. So let's read together about the lows of testing. The big idea here is is that this is a group of people who, yes, have been worshiping God, but for generations before have been slaves in Egypt. And God's so kind to them that he has said he's going to be their God and they're going to be his people and his presence amongst them now needs to take root so that they can be formed into his image. Terry Virgo helped me understand what's about to happen now because part of us is like, why is God testing? What's going on now? But, but he said, think about it. You, you've been a slave for over 400 years. No one in your family's ever had to make any major significant kind of financial decisions. You haven't been able maybe to have a, own a home. You haven't really made any decisions around the workplace. Pharaoh's told you exactly what to do, when to do it. And what is now happening is God is helping this group of people be formed into image bearers. Remember, uh, most people at that time, uh, as, as kings would have set up stone statues or wooden statues to represent the image of the ruler of the land. That's what, how God's done, how Yahweh's done it. Yahweh has made male and female in his image and he's using them to put him on display. So this period of testing is incredibly important. Let's, let's read about it from verse 22 onwards. Then Moses made Israel set out from the Red Sea and they went into the wilderness of Sur. They went three days in the wilderness and found no water. That's not a good situation. The word wilderness could also be translated as desert. To be in the desert for three days to have no water is not a good picture. What's going to happen at this point? Do you think the people are going to respond well or not? Let's see. Verse 23 continues. Then they came to Marah. They could not drink the water of Marah because it was bitter. Therefore, it was called Marah, which means uh, bitter. And the people grumbled against Moses saying, what Shall we drink? Can you see the, the lows of testing, right? They, they've, they've encountered a desert. They think they've got water, but it's incredibly bitter, and they start grumbling. How is how's Yahweh going to respond to their grumbling? How's, how's Moses going to respond to their grumbling? Let's read verse 25. They cried to the Lord, and the Lord showed him a log, and he threw it into the water, and the water became sweet. The people have grumbled. Moses has cried out to Yahweh. Yahweh has responded by providing a a, a log or or a piece of wood and essentially that has made bitter water sweet. How gracious is God? How good is God? That despite their grumbling, he's taken the situation and turned it for their good. You might be saying, Paul, how do you know this is a test? Well, we read it in Scripture. It says from verse 25, there the Lord made for them a statute and a rule, and there he tested them. That's what's going on here with with the bitter water. There's a test. And he's saying, if you will diligently listen to the voice of the Lord your God and do that which is right in his eyes and give ear to his commandments and keep all his statutes, I will put none of the diseases on you that are put on the Egyptians, for I am the Lord your healer. See, God's, God's testing them and he's trying to show them what's in their hearts and so that they will, they will bring that before him in his presence and he can then form them into the kind of people who are going to be image bearers. He's asking them to listen. He's asking them to trust him. And even though they fail the test, he, he takes bitterness makes it sweet and he leads them on to an oasis we told that there there are 12 springs which represent kind of the 12 tribes that have make up the the people of israel and there's 70 palm trees and they have this this kind of paradise experience in the desert but there's another test on the way 
How are they going to do this time? What's their response going to be? Let's read. Let's read. They set out from Elam. That's that place, that oasis with palm trees and, and living uh, uh, fountains of water. And all the congregation of the people of Israel came to the wilderness of Sin, which is between Elam and Sinai, on the 15th day of the second month after they had departed from the land of Egypt. And the whole congregation of the people of Israel, now remember, this is the whole congregation that just sang to Yahweh, just celebrated on the other side of the Red Sea, that this whole congregation of the people of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. And the people of Israel said to them, would that we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt when we sat by the meat pots and ate bread to the full, for you have brought us out into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. This whole congregation of people has gone from singing to grumbling in a flash. And they're living with a, a, a measure of unreality, right? They're talking about meat pots and bread in full in Egypt. And I don't know how many times that happened at all, but they're convinced that life was better under previous management. They, they clearly are demonstrating a lack of trust in the goodness of God. How will God respond this time? How will Moses respond this time? Let's find out in verse 4. The Lord said to Moses, Behold, I'm about to rain bread from heaven for you, and the people shall go out and gather a day's portion every day that I may test them. There we go. There's another testing taking place. Whether they will walk in my law or not, on the sixth day when they prepare what they bring in, it will be twice as much as they gather daily. How gracious is God? There's, there's grumbling. <laughs> How does God respond? He promises a meal, a meal that will arrive every day, fresh every morning. And actually, it's not just the provision of a meal. You'll notice every seventh day, there isn't anything, but it's because there's been a double portion given on the sixth day. God is, God is reminding them of creation. He's taking them back to Genesis. He's taking them back to the seventh day of creation. And he's not just giving them manna, he's giving them Sabbath rest. And again, you'd ask, but Paul, how, how, how's this testing a good thing? How, how, why is God always testing them? Remember, it is a good God that tests them because it's a God who wants them to see what's truly happening in their hearts, to reveal what's going on so that they don't live in self-deception and that they can be bringing all of that to God and in, in, in his grace. So they, they grumbled. God has promised to provide bread every day. All they need to do is not keep anything back and not go out on the seventh day when they should have collected enough on the sixth. Let's read how they do. Let's see how they do with this test. Verse 19, Moses said to them, let no one leave any of it until the morning. But they did not listen to Moses. Some left part of it till the morning and it bred worms and stank. And then there's the first that Reminds us as Moses is very much like you and I. Finally, he reveals what's going on in his heart. It says, and Moses was angry with them. How, how true to life does that sound? A group of people are told what they should do, and they say, no, nah, we know better. They disobey God. They don't trust God. They believe the lie that God doesn't have their best in mind. God, God's taking care of himself, but not those he's made in his image. The, the lie that Adam and, uh, believe, uh, and Eve believed in the God and the lie you and I are tempted with every day, not to trust our creator God, but to try and make it by our own terms and by our own means. And what they're left with is worms and stink. You see, when you fail a test, I hope it wakes you up to the reality of what's going on and it prompts you to seek help. I was helped by a couple of analogies. The one is, you know, you know when you um, think you've got your credit card on you and you're going through life going, I've got my credit card in my wallet, I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm fine. And then suddenly you arrive at a till and suddenly you realize, wait, where is my credit card? Where is my wallet? And you, you start thinking, when last did I said, what's going on? And you run through your mind and it's a fran frantic panic. You see, what, what happens in that particular moment is it reveals something. You thought you had something all this time, but you didn't. And this moment, as unpleasant as it is, is just revealing the true state of affairs. And you can now take action based on it. 
Or how about, um, how about being the people of God in Egypt? You, you come out of Egypt, you think you set free. You're like, whoa, we're out of Egypt, we're free. But yet you actually still have Egypt in your heart. And you need that to be revealed so that you bring it into the gracious presence of God and are transformed and renewed. And God comes towards you and gives you the Ten Commandments. He gives you the law so that you can become image bearers that speak of God's goodness to the world. Maybe you've been listening to me and saying, but Paul, I, I know the Ten Commandments. I know what God requires. And quite frankly, I try for a bit, but I, I, I fail. I'm not meant to ever be at like the level that a preacher or a life group leader or a worship leader could ever get to. You know, I'm, I'm, just, I'm, just, I'm just giving up on this whole thing. Well, just a, an encouragement. Imagine if you went to a doctor and a doctor gave you diagnosis after diagnosis of what's wrong with you. You wouldn't throw your hands up and go, oh, I failed again. Oh, this is so upsetting. No, I, I think you would roll up your sleeves and say, thank you for revealing what's going on in my life. I long to be changed and I want to come back so that you can give me not just a diagnosis, but a prescription of, of what it is that transforms me and renews me. I mean, no, no metaphor is perfect, but that one I think should hopefully encourage those of you that feel like a measure of not measuring up when it comes to being an image bearer. To not run away from the doctor, but run towards the doctor. And we're going to see that next week as we continue to see the people of God coming into God's presence, having these tests for 40 years, being molded and shaped and, and, and allowed to eventually inhabit the promised land because they have become the image bearers they're always meant to be. They woke up to their condition. I didn't have the credit card, I thought. I didn't have the diagnosis that I wanted, but man, I'm so glad that I've got God's presence to guide me. You see, I've called this point the lows of testing, but it's actually not true. It's initially low, it's initially challenging, but from that point onwards, it becomes an opportunity for growth and development and joy as we set free of those things that are in our lives or the things that have been holding us back and we're in God's glorious presence. So we've had uh, the highs of worship for the people of God straight into the lows of testing. And finally, I wouldn't be doing you um, any justice if I didn't also speak about the gift of resting, the gift of resting. Verse 27 says, on the seventh day, some of the people went out together, but they found none. Remember, the manna was going to come for six days. And on that sixth day, double portion. And so there was no need to go out on the seventh day. On the sixth day, that bit of manna you kept would not be eaten by worms, would not be stinky. It would, it, would, it would maintain for that Sabbath rest. But the people of God don't trust and they go out looking and they find nothing. And the Lord said to Moses, how long will you refuse to keep my commandments and my laws? See, the Lord has given you the Sabbath. Therefore, on the sixth day, he gives you bread for two days. Remain each of you in his place. Let no one go out of his place on the seventh day. So the people rested on the seventh day. We we'll read that verse again. So the people rested on the seventh day. Do you appreciate how huge this is? You've been slaves, your people, for over 400 years. Any decision was out of your hands. It was how high Pharaoh, how wide Pharaoh, how deep Pharaoh, how long Pharaoh what straw you were going to use, what materials you were going to use. You have been an enslaved people, and now you can rest. You've never rested a day in your life, but now you can rest. Who else rested on the seventh day? Who else? Well, again, our mind goes to Genesis. It goes to Adam and Eve. It goes to those who were made in the image of God, male and female, on the sixth day. And God gave them dominion and God said, you're going to rule and you're going to reign with me, heaven and earth together. And they would have gone to bed that night and they would have thought, oh my goodness, I can't wait for the next morning. I can't believe we get to do this. And they would have woken up and then it would have been Sabbath. It would have been rest. And they would have gone, no, but my email account's all sorted out. I'm ready to roll. Let's do this. And God said, no, 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 no. You're missing it. You start from a place of rest. You start with a reminder that this creation is good and you made in my image. And I rest on the seventh day. And so you rest as well. You see, it's a beautiful image of what it means to be image bearers, to remember that we're not, we're not machines made out of wood or, or, or iron. Or we, we're made in the image of God, male and female. And the application for us 
is to receive, the invitation for us is to receive this gift of rest in a, in a busyness culture which is always on, which is work hard, play hard. And, and you're encouraged to almost do 50 weeks of hard graft so you can get like two scrawny little weeks of holiday which you hope are going to boost you for the next 50 weeks of hard graft. No, in that world, something completely new is being introduced. The rest of God. My question to you today is, Instead of that culture which encourages you always, how are you doing? Busy, I'm busy, I'm busy. You won't believe it. Zoom calls, always, I'm busy, I'm busy. That culture, there's an alternative to say, no, I'm, I'm limited. I've got limits. I, I can't just go always on. I, I go for six days because it's good to be made in the image of God, a God who worked for six days. It's good to work. It's good to take the raw materials of life, weave them together for human flourishing. I love all of that, but I've placed a limit. I've declared that there will be a stop. And out of that place, I, I work out of a place of rest. For the Mourn family, because we're involved in church on Sunday, Sundays, uh, for us it's a Friday 6 p.m. to a Saturday 6 p.m. deal. And we try and get some pizza on the promenade and we uh, have uh, lovely desserts and we play games with the kids. We maybe watch a movie the next day, listen to music we haven't to a while. We play, pleasure stack a whole bunch of things we enjoy doing. And our kind of two criteria is saying, man, is this restful and is this joyful? Do, are we ceasing or and are we celebrating and are we worshiping God? And as we do that, we learn about what it means to be an image bearer and we become those who reflect him to the world. You see, we are not just those that have been drawn out of our sin and drawn out of slavery. No, we've been drawn into relationship, drawn into this journey of formation, sanctification, discipleship. It's so much more than just a salvation ticket. It's a relationship with God. He's told us, I will be your God and you will be my people. And we grow as we embrace the rhythms and the limits that he's placed like Sabbath. But is that it? I mean, is that, is that the end of the message? Saying, okay, Paul, I get it. I must worship more than grumble and I must try and have a 24-hour break. No, I, I'm not helping you again if I leave it there. I want to I talk to you about the Lord of the Sabbath. I want to talk to you about Jesus Christ, our Messiah. You see, he healed people on the Sabbath, and some people came to him and said, what are you doing? Doing work on the, on the, on the Sabbath. You should be having pizza on the promenade and pleasure stacking. And what are you doing working? And Jesus said, no, you don't understand. Man wasn't made for the Sabbath, but Sabbath was made for the man. And I am the Lord of the Sabbath. It's only in him that we find true rest. And, and if, you, if you think about it, when... When else has, has wood come into bitterness and created sweetness? When, when, when you read that account in Exodus, I'm sure your mind goes to the cross of Christ. A cross which took the bitterness of our sin and our rebellion against God and turned it ultimately into the ultimate celebration, the ultimate sweetness of eternity with God. And when you look at the manna that was provided freshly every day, can you picture Jesus uh, breaking bread with his disciples saying, this is my body broken for you. This is the one who's described as, as the bread of life, the one who, who came to share his body with those who were perishing. You see, we, we are all people like the Israelites on a journey, uh, on a pilgrimage with the presence of God to lead us. And we're not in the promised land yet, but we have the presence of a God who came to rescue us, the Lord of the Sabbath, the one who makes the bitter things of life sweet, and the, the one who offers himself and his body as the bread of life. And so when we, when we come to this God now, we in worship just take an opportunity to confess our need for him and confess our dependence on him. It's a picture I'm, I'm going to conclude our time with, which was from World War II. There were a lot of children impacted in many ways by the war. And one of the orphanages found that a lot of the children, when they were going to bed, used to keep little bits of food in their mouth, in their cheeks. And no matter how much they convinced them that there was going to be a meal the next day, they didn't trust it. Their survival mechanism, their limbic system was fight or flight. They, they didn't trust it. And they, so they stored up a little bit of something every night before going to bed. And that orphanage did something which transformed those kids. What they would do is they would bake bread at nighttime and they would give the children, as they got into bed, a loaf of bread. And they'd essentially, by giving them that loaf, assure them 
that there was going to be provision for them. There was enough. And they would relax and they would stop storing those bits in their cheeks and they would have good rest. Their limbic system would be untriggered and they slowly were able to develop to become children who, who were, were better image bearers. They were set free. Think about those children and I think about this message and I think about my life and I think to what extent do I keep little bits stored up in my cheeks, little things that I think I need to have in order to get through the next day where God is opening up himself to say, I will provide freshly every morning. I will form you. I will shape you. Trust me. Don't believe the lie. Come to me and receive the bread of life. Let's pray together. God, thank you for your word. And right now, as we think about those areas of our lives where we are not trusting you, Perhaps it's the most important area, which is, which is with our shame and our rebellion and just the truth that we haven't believed you. We've believed lies that tell us that you're not trustworthy, that you're not good. God, we bring that to you now. Some of us for the first time confessing our need for a savior, saying, Jesus Christ, I need you. I confess my sin and I invite your work of salvation in my life. And others of us who have maybe confessed you as Savior before, freshly again today, confessing our need for you as our Lord, asking you to be that bread of life freshly now. We worship you, God, and we long to run back to you when we fail the tests of life to experience your kindness and your grace freshly. Amen.